So hello everyone, uh, welcome to our seminar again. And today we have Burak Hatinoğlu. He is from University of California, Santa Cruz, and his title is a complex analytic approach to inverse spectral problems. Burak, thanks a lot for being with us today. And we are listening to you. Thank for the introduction. Thank you everyone for attending. So as I mentioned, my title will be a complex analytic approach. In Sorry. Okay, so this will be my title. And actually this work was published in Journal of Spectral Theory. In the paper, you can find the details of today's talk. So let's start with our plan. So I will first start by talking about spectral properties of Schrodinger operator on finite interval. Then we will mainly focus on well titmash M function because it is one of the main connections from spectral theory to complex function theory. Then I will talk about classical results and some recent results on inverse spectral problems of Schrodinger operators. Then we will focus on a specific problem with mixed given data. And I will finish by discussing relatively new results on connections between inverse spectral problems and exponential systems. So let's start by spectral properties of Schrodinger operators on the finite interval. Our main object will be Schrodinger on the interval. Actually, this is just Sturm level operator. So 2.1 will be the main equation we are going to consider. And we will consider this equation with the given boundary conditions 2.2 and 2.3. And so here, alpha and beta are just some constants between 0 and pi. And this function Q is usually called potential function. And in inverse problems, usually it is assumed to be real valued. And throughout the talk, we will mostly consider L1 potentials. So one of the well-known result is that in this setting with the given boundary conditions, the spectrum of the Schrodinger operator is discrete and a real sequence which is bounded from below and actually diverging to infinity. So that means in this setting, the spectrum is always just pure points. So that means we just talk about eigenvalues. And additionally, one can assume without loss of generality that this spectrum lies on the positive real axis because we know that it is bounded below. And if you just add a constant to the potential, what you do is just shifting your spectrum to the right by the same constant. And actually we know more about the eigenvalues. We explicitly know this asymptotic uh, relations. So here you can see depending on uh, the sign of alpha and beta. So for instance, first one tells us how the eigenvalues uh, behave. And here this extra alpha and parts are the asymptotic parts which are little over as n goes to infinity. And as I said, for most of the talk, our potential function Q will be L1. So therefore this alpha n will be little over one. But if you assume the potential function to be L2, you can obtain the same asymptotics by having alpha n square summable. And actually, if you just consider the potential to be zero, which is also called a free operator, then this integral part and the asymptotics just disappears. And next, let's talk more about the weight mash M function. So how do we introduce this? First, we start by introducing two solutions, SC and CC, which are satisfying the Schumdewell equation with this given initial conditions. So if we recall the original equation, so here kind of we pick the first initial condition, we picked alpha and then consider equation 2.1 with this given 
initial conditions. And actually the reason they denoted by S and C is just because, again, if we consider zero potential, this function just becomes sine and cosine. And that's the reason we use these notations. Okay, uh, firstly, using the function S, we can introduce so-called norming constants. Uh, which will be important for us in our discussion of immersed spectral problems. And it is simply defined as we pick an eigenvalue from the spectrum and we just consider this integral for the function S where Z is that eigenvalue. Yeah. Okay, let's keep this in mind. And if we return back to the function S and C, we can first observe that they are linearly independent solutions and their Ron scan is just one. And this observation allows us to represent any solution U again solving our Stumlevel equation, this time boundary conditions at pi. So we can represent any such solution U in terms of S and C as follows. And here, this coefficient is uniquely defined what I mean is if you want to represent the solution U as C plus some coefficient times S, that coefficient has just a unique representation and we call this M, M function. And this is given by the ratio of this to Ronskin, Ronskin of C with U divided by Ronskin of S with U. And this representation allows us to introduce the definition of welted smash m function. That coefficient m alpha beta is called the m function. And this is here you can see its definition. And obviously it depends on alpha and beta because alpha, as you can see, uh, explicitly appears in the representation. And remember, beta comes from the boundary condition of u. U is the solution satisfying this boundary condition depending on beta. That's why we have M function in terms of alpha, beta, and we can introduce U for any Z. So therefore, this is a function of Z. Okay, why M function is important for us? On one hand, it will carry out many spectral properties of the equation. And on the other hand, it will also satisfy nice complex function theoretic properties. And we can start with asymptotics. In 1972, Everett proved uh, the following asymptotic for the well M function. If we just assume alpha to be zero, M function on the upper plane has this following asymptotics, i times root z plus some little of one term. But if alpha is non-zero, then you get this asymptotics. And both of them are valid on the upper plane as z goes to infinity in modules. But what is more important is the fact that m alpha m function is a uh, meromorphic hard loss function. So let me recall what a meromorphic hard loss function is. First of all, an analytic function on the upper plane with positive imaginary part is called hard loss. So what we have is just an analytic function on the upper plane mapping upper plane to upper plane. This is a hard loss function. And if we can extend this function to the whole plane metamorphically, it is called a metamorphic hard loss function. And here what happens is a metamorphic hard loss function maps upper plane to upper plane, real line to real line on its domain, and a unique extension unique metamorphic extension to the whole complex plane, it also maps a negative a lower half plane to lower half plane. And therefore it satisfied this relation. Uh, a simple example you can think about, for instance, root of Z as an hard loss function, but we know that of course, root of Z cannot be extend metamorphically to the whole plane. So therefore it is just a hard loss function. But if we consider, for instance, the ratio Z minus one divided by Z, this is a metamorphic hard loss function. And I think as you may guess, our 
well, M function will be a meromorphic loss function, as I mentioned, but uh, it is not hard to show. But another important property of meromorphic hard loss function is the following representation. So any meromorphic hard loss function can be described as a Schwarz integral of a discrete Poisson finite measure. First, let me show the representation. Here, what we have is a linear part plus I times so-called Schwarz integral of measure mu. And this is explicitly what that Schwarz integral means. And it's taken on the real line. And what is special about metamorphic Hartmann's function case is that this measure is discrete and Poisson finite. And by Poisson finite, we mean, sorry, Poisson finite, we mean the following. On the real line, the integral of the measure may not be finite, but the integral of the measure divided by x squared is finite, or let's say one plus x squared to avoid uh, possible uh, bad behavior at zero. So this is the meaning of Poisson finite measure. And so this is the representation we have. Actually, this representation valid even if we don't have meromorphic hard loss function, but just a hard loss function. What happens is this time the measure may not be discrete. This is the change, but in our settings, since while M function will be a meromorphic hard loss function, this measure will always be discrete. So simply for this integral, we will have just an infinite sum. And this representation is also called Hartloss representation theorem. And if we just uh, consider what we discussed about metamorphic Hartloss function together, the Hartloss representation theorem and the asymptotic of well M function, we have the following representation. Here, what happens is because of the asymptotics of the well M function, this linear part just becomes a constant when we consider m alpha beta. And here we get the same integral. And this measure will be uniquely determined by m. And we will call the spectral measure. And we just discussed that this measure will be a discrete measure. And what is more important for us is that this measure is supported on the spectrum, sigma alpha beta. So if I just denote this spectrum eigenvalues by a, a n, my measure just becomes some point masses supported on eigenvalues. And if you want to explicitly see this constant, you can just plug in i to your function because when you put i, this integral will become some number purely imaginary. So therefore, a will be just real part. Okay, we will call this measure the spectral measure of the Schrodinger operator corresponding to this m function, or if you want, corresponding to this boundary conditions. And if you remember, we have introduced the norming constants. Let me recall that. We have introduced some function S and we have introduced norming constants. And they explicitly give us this point masses. Actually, point masses of the spectral measure, nothing but the reciprocal of the norming constants at the given eigenvalue. So what does that mean? The spectral measure actually carry us the information of the spectrum and the corresponding norming constants. And therefore, by, by this representation, M function carries out the same info. Okay. And just to illustrate what we discussed so far, let me consider some examples. So here we will just let the potential to be zero. So we consider free operator with the most common boundary conditions namely Dirichle and Neumann. And in this setting, for instance, with Dirichle-Dirichle boundary condition, the eigenvalues or the spectrum just become squares of the natural numbers. Here, I start natural numbers from one. 
And this is our M function. And here, this is the spectral measure. As you can see, this measure is not summable, but it's, it is Poisson finite. So that means if you divide this by one plus n square square, one plus n to the four, this sum will be summed. And the other two examples shows what happens if we consider Neumann Dirichlet and Neumann Neumann boundary conditions. And let me also show a picture which illustrates one of the important properties. So here in this graph, you see the well M function for the boundary condition for Dirichlet Dirichlet or both alpha and beta zero. And here in the picture, you see this M function evaluated on the real line. And this dots shows you the red ones is the zero set of the well M function, but at the same time, it is the spectrum with boundary conditions pi over two zero or Neumann Dirichlet, and the poles are Dirichlet Dirichlet. So this also illustrates what we just discussed. The M function uh, has the poles of the corresponding spectrum, which is also the support of the measure, uh, the spect corresponding spectral measure. And here we see another important property. If we consider two, uh, two spectra, they're always interlacing. By interlacing, we mean if you pick two consecutive eigenvalue from one spectrum, in between them, there will be always one eigenvalue from the other spectrum. So this is so-called interlacing property. And this is also the key property which makes the M function a uh, metamorphic heart loss function. Okay, after all this discussion, now we can discuss some results from inverse spectral theory of Schrodinger operators. Okay, and let me start by classical results. So here we will discuss on the uniqueness results and more explicitly, we will say that a Schrodinger operator is determined by its spectral data if we consider any other operator with the same data and obtain the same potential almost everywhere on the interval we work on. And the first inverse spectral result of that type goes back to almost 100 years ago, and it was given by Amber Simeon. What he said is, if we consider a potential which is continuous on our interval zero pi, and if we assume its spectrum with Neumann-Neumann boundary conditions is n square, then this potential is zero. And later that Borg found that Ambersumian's result was something special. And in general, what one needs is just to consider two spectra. And this is Borg's result. What he did was considering an alarm potential. And he considered one spectrum specifically a boundary condition with, with alpha zero and some beta. And the second spectrum has the, has the boundary conditions for alpha two, which is non-zero and the same beta. And what he said is that if you consider uh, the union of these two spectrum, maybe with one exception of an eigenvalue if beta is non-zero, this data uniquely determines the potential. And what is important is that no proper subset has the same property. So that means if you lose info of even one eigenvalue, you also lose the uniqueness. And then Levinson removed the restriction that uh, in Borg's result in the first spectrum, you have zero on the uh, one boundary condition. He just considered the most general case and he obtained what today is called two spectra theorem. So namely, if you consider different values of alpha one and alpha beta, and if you consider these two spectrum, then they uniquely determine the potential. 
and of course by unique determination of potential we mean unique determination of the operator it just depends on the potential and so Levinson's result nowadays also sometimes called Borg Levinson's theorem or two spectra theorem and Another classical result is given by Marchenko, and he showed that the spectral measure or the corresponding M function also provides sufficient spectral data to recover the potential. So namely, this is a result. Again, he considered an L1 potential, and here spectral measure or the M function determines the potential uniquely. And if we recall how we represented the spectral measure, we can also uh, state Marchenko's theorem as follows. The norming constants or the point masses of the spectral measure and one full spectrum uniquely determines the potential. Okay, very quickly, let me recall. Okay, so this is how we represented the uh, spectral measure. And we said that the point masses can be given in terms of norming constants and the spectral measure is supported on the spectrum. So therefore, we can read Marchenko theorem as follows. And then Hochsta and Lieberman observed that one spectrum actually recovers the potential if we know half of it. So they proved the following result for an L1 potential, if the potential is given on the half interval zero to pi over two, then in order to recover the, uh, the other half uniquely, what you need is just one spectrum. And these results may be called classical results, but nowadays there is a really huge literature on inverse spectral theory and maybe some of them can be collected under the following titles. So one can try to work inverse spectral problem by using just various spectral data. These are also called borg marchenko type results. Or one can use mixture of potential and spectral data as we just observed in the hochsta lieberman case. And these are called hochsta lieberman type results. So in the classical results, we saw that potential was assumed to be L1, but it's also possible to consider various smoothness classes for the potential. And also one can consider eigenparameter dependent boundary conditions. And I will give one example for each of this first item. And relatively new but important approach was finding connections with exponential systems. And I will uh, try to focus more on this one at the end of the talk. And of course, one change the setting, one can work with infinite matrices, with Jacobi operators, I can, I can work with Schrodinger operators on the half line, real line, or also quantum graphs. And let me just consider some examples on more relatively recent results. So for in these results, we will consider the following counting function. So namely n sub a t will count the elements in a given set a, which are less than t. And if we consider a as our spectrum, we know that it is bounded below. So therefore, for any subset of the spectrum, this counting function will be well defined. And first result I want to talk about is due to guest as a Simon and Del Rio. And what they, what they did was generalizing Borg-Levinson's theorem to three spectra. We know that Borg-Levinson theorem tells us that two spectra uniquely recover the operator. So maybe roughly speaking, we may say that then two thirds of the spectra also two, sorry, let's say two thirds of three given spectra should also uniquely recover the operator. And this is how they formulated it. So they consider some subset of given three spectra, their union, and they check the counting function. If the counting function of that set 
is greater than or equal to two thirds of the counting function of the union of these three spectra for sufficiently large T, then this set S uniquely determines the potential. And this was kind of a generalization of borg levinson's theorem. And then in 2000, Gestes and Simon also generalized hochstadt lieberman theorem using a similar approach. Now what they did was, okay, let me recall the hochstadt lieberman theorem. In hochstadt lieberman theorem, we are given the potential on the half of the interval, 0 pi over 2. And we are also given one full spectrum. Then this data uniquely determines the potential. What they did was playing with the length of the interval and then considering some subset of the spectrum. So here we consider uh, the potential on the interval 0 to a for some a between pi over 2 and pi. And we consider some subset of the spectrum. And again, if that set satisfy this inequality for the given counting functions for sufficient large t, then this data uniquely determines the potential. The potential on the given interval 0 to a and the subset of the spectrum. And Gestes and Simon also observed that we can. Uh, remove the knowledge of some eigenvalues if we play with the smoothness of the potential. What they showed was the following. They considered again a L1 potential. If we are told that in a neighborhood of the midpoint, the potential function is C to the 2K, then uh, the potential on the first half and not the spectrum, but spectrum except k plus one eigenvalues also determine the potential. So that means, roughly speaking, for 2k smoothness degree, we can remove k plus one eigenvalues from the spectrum. And very recently, uh, Guluyev proved a two spectra problem, Borg Levinson type problem where the boundary conditions depends on the eigen, eigen parameter. And here, this is his formulation. So here, the spectrum with sub in this is little f and capital F denote the spectrum of the Schrodinger operator with this given boundary conditions. And here, little f and capital F depend on our eigen parameter Z. And what we assume is that these functions, little f and capital F, to be rational Hartwell's functions. And, and here, capital F may also be infinity, uh, meaning the Dirichlet condition. And in this setting, he proved that if we know the two spectra and the poles of little f, then this data uniquely determines the potential. And, and now uh, let me talk about a problem in more detail, which consists of mixed data. And for this problem, our main motivation is the following. Let's recall that borg levinsons theorem and Marchenko's theorem, what did they say? borg levinsons tell us that two spectra uniquely de determine the potential. And Marchenko told us that one spectrum and the norming constants or the point masses of the spectral measure also uniquely determines the potential. So the question is, what if we are somewhere between? So that means, can we recover the potential from one full spectrum, partial information on the second spectrum and the set of point masses of the spectral measure corresponding to the first one or the norming constants? So we will discuss this problem. So, so this was the problem I worked in my uh, PhD. And one of other mo motivation for us was the following fact. So nowadays, both borg Levinson and Marchenko theorems can be deduced using purely complex theoretic methods, namely Kranich spectral shifts and Cauchy integrals. But for this 
problem, these methods do not work. So therefore, this was also important in the point of view of complex function theory, not on spectral theory. But first, let us uh, state this problem mathematically. And this is the following theorem. So here we have an L1 potential and some subset of the real line. This will be our index set. And what is given is the following spectral data, one full spectrum. Uh, and for simplicity here, I will just discuss Dirichlet, Dirichlet, Neumann, Dirichlet, but the other boundary conditions can also be handled. So AN just denotes the Dirichlet, Dirichlet eigenvalues and BN, BN Neumann, Dirichlet eigenvalues. And here we know Neumann, Dirichlet eigenvalues except the index at A, but we know the norming constants for AN at the same index set. And this spectral data uniquely determines the potential Q. And here again, let me recall that gamma in is nothing but the point masses of the spectral measure corresponding to drift the, the boundary condition. And so this was a, a theorem I proved and let me a bit talk about sketch of the proof. And in order to start one first need the following infinite product representation of M function. So the M function corresponding to Dirichlet Dirichlet boundary condition can be represented in terms of these two spectra in the following way. And here the Dirichlet Dirichlet spectrum just becomes the set of poles and Neumann Dirichlet spectrum just becomes the set of, set of zeros. And, and here uh, you can see a sketch. And first, uh, let me go over it and I will show it in detail. The first step was using this lemma and to get this infinite product representation. Uh, so use the lemma to represent M function as an infinite product with this given set of poles and zeros. And the second step is reducing the problem to the uniqueness of an infinite product with given poles and residues. And here, maybe let me show it this way. Okay, so here we start with this M function. And what we do is just factorizing this as two infinite products. Okay. And here, let's focus on the fact that we know all BN and with this index set. And we know all A. So this allows us to just pick this infinite product, call it F of Z. And what we know about F is the following. We know all AN, so all the poles, of course. We know none of the zeros, but we know all residues of F at AN using the information given to us. And the nice thing is, since we know that AN and BN are interlacing, so they are coming from two different spectra, and since we keep the same index set, still they will be interlacing and still F will be a metamorphic Herklos function. And this allows us to get the third step. So that means we can use the Herklos representation theorem and get this representation. So now what is nice about the right-hand side is we know everything in this infinite sum because it just consists of the poles with the index at A and the residues, and we know all of them. So what is left is just the linear part, and it's a bit technical, but it's possible to show that with the given data, the coefficient B will be zero and the constant D will be uniquely determined. So what does that mean? The right-hand side on three is uniquely determined. So that means F is uniquely determined. But remember, F was consisting of 
just ANs and BNs. So that means the unknown BNs were also uniquely determined. So in other words, the two spectra are uniquely determined. So BNs are unique. So therefore we can use borg levinson and obtain uniqueness of the potential. So this was kind of the idea of the sketch. And I a bit quickly went over it, but if you have any question, I can get it. And here you can see the same steps. And now we have just proved these results, which is kind of a mixed problem. And of course, one natural question may be, okay, here the index sets are matching. That means whenever we lose, I get, we lose information of PN, we get the information of gamma. What if these two indexes uh, do not match? So in that case, we need some extra information, but still we can get the uniqueness result. So if we have different index sets, so that means we lose info of BN at some index at B, and we are given point masses at some index at A. So here, what we need is the following extra condition. So, so here, a sub k n uh, denotes the indices at which we also know the norming constants. And B sub L n is the subsequence on which we don't know uh, the eigenvalue. So we don't know simply B sub L n. And in this case, if this ratio is absolutely convergent, and by absolutely convergent, I mean uh, this general factor AKN over B ln minus one is absolutely summable. Then this data you need to determine the potential. And again, we have used the same notations, Drifle, Drifle, Neumann, Drifle, spectra, and the corresponding point masses. And so this is not a characterization, this is one way result. So this condition may be improved, but so this is what I have obtained if we have non-matching index set case. And so here maybe I can mention one point that this is so far the first time we discussed some condition of the set of spectrum in terms of their position in addition to their size. All the previous examples, we roughly speaking, focused on size of the spectrum, how much of it we know, how many spectra we know. But here we also have some condition on the position. And actually in that uh, perspective, the most remarkable result was due to Horvath, which makes the connection between exponential systems and the inverse spectral problems, which also allows the connection with one of the deep results of the harmonic analysis. And in 2005, Horvath proved the following result, and this was published in Annals of Mathematics. So he considered some potential, which is LP, not necessarily L1. And again, he considered some constant between zero and pi. And here, lambda n will be some eigenvalues from this given spectrum. And then he obtained the following characterization result, the potential on the interval zero A and the eigenvalues lambda N, the given eigenvalues, some subset, determine the potential if and only if this exponential system is complete in LP on the interval A minus P. Remember A appears here. A is the size of the interval on which the potential is known. And here, this exponential system consists of e to the plus minus two i root eigenvalues x and some additional exponential. And this can be anything except the eigenvalues. And what is also remarkable is that this is a characterization result. And yeah, he was the first to make these connections. And after that, Makorov and Poltaraski 
work and a coolant formulation of Horvath's result, and they represented this result in, ter in terms of so-called burling mellowan theory. And so let me introduce that. So there are a bit technical details, but it will allow us to make the connection with the very deep results of harmonic analysis. First, let us introduce so-called short sequence of disjoint intervals. Here, what we do is we just consider some disjoint intervals on the real line, and we just consider this summation. So on the top, we have just the size of the intervals, and on the denominator, we have their distance to the origin. And we have this one plus just to avoid some technical problem if we have zero in one of these intervals. So you can just simply think this as the length of the interval divided by is its distance to the origin is square sum of it. If we have this condition, we call such a sequence short. And if the summation is divergent, we call it long. And Berling and Malivan introduced so-called exterior density of a sequence as follows. Here, this lambda is just a sequence and d star lambda is the supremum of d such that you can find the long sequence such that this property is valid. So that means here you count the number of elements from the sequence inside the given uh, interval and you divide this this by the size of the interval. And this is bounded by some uniform constant D. And for a long sequence, we just consider such Ds and the maximal of such Ds give, give us D star. Okay, it's a bit technical. We don't need to understand all the details, but this uh, will allow the characterization of uh, some completeness problem, which I will show in the second slide. And again, here, uh, your sequence is some real sequence, but you can also extend this definition to non-real sequences. Simply what you do is uh, you just consider uh, one over some complex sequence, consider the real part, and then again, take the reciprocal and you introduce this new real sequence, then what happens is its burling malivan density will be same as the original sequence. So that's how you handle with complex sequences. But what I want to focus on is the following result, which is called burling malivan theorem. And this is considered one of the important, most important results of harmonic analysis, which simply says that you can just characterize the maximal interval for which this exponential system e to the i lambda z is complete in L square functions on this interval, just in terms of the star of lambda. And using this Sperling Malevanter and Horvath's result, Makarov and Poltoraski gave the following result. So here, what they did was considering some sequence of discrete non-zero complex numbers, some L square potential, and they showed the following characterization result. The potential on some interval D, such that D is greater than A, and the value of the M function at lambda N determine the potential Q, if and only if we have this inequality. So the exterior Berling Mulliman density is greater than or equal to one minus A divided by pi. And here this M tilde is just, you can think as the regular while M function we have discussed, they considered a slightly different version, but it's just a technical detail. So you can think about the values of some given points uh, the values of the M function at some given points. And so they obtained these results in 2017. So this was one of other connection with 
learning relevant theory and inverse spectral problems. And let me finish by another results of them uh, in the same paper. Makarov and Paul Tarski, they also proved so-called an uncertain version of Borg's two spectral theorem. Why it is an uncertain version? Because remember in the Borg's theorem, if we are given two spectra, we know that this uniquely determinist operator. So here what happens is we are given some sequence of intervals such that we are sure that the two spectra lives on these intervals, but we are not explicitly given these two spectra. So that's why it's kind of uncertain version, but we have this property and we are also given the potential on some small neighborhood of zero. And this condition determines Q if and only if we have this condition for any long sequence of Jn, this uh, infinite sum uh, of uh, the sequence In divided by Jn does not converge to zero. So that's also another characterization problem. And uh, let me stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Burak. Excellent talk. Uh, any questions or comments, anyone? Uh, may I ask, uh, excuse me, may I ask a question? But I don't, I don't see the participants how to, um, one, one moment, please. Stand out. Ah, now I see. So I have some, uh, so it's an interesting talk. There, are, um, uh, there is much information and uh, it's interesting. And uh, I want to ask about, uh, about uh, the, the, the place when you, uh, you um, speak about mixed spectral data. There, there, there was some uh, drawing. Oh, sure. Yeah, let me let me share. Yeah. You mean this one or? Uh, yes, yes. No, um, I, 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 when I, you had a talk, I was thinking about how one can, uh, how would it be possible to use uh, mixed information, and uh, this is uh, yes, and I, I see the, I, I see this idea idea. So if you, if, when you can, when you consider uh, uh, so uh, n minus a part, mm -hmm. uh, there, uh, this part is known given uh, uh, parts of eigenvalues. Yes, this part is known. Yeah. So, so the the rest part is uh, would be also known, but it's not known because. Uh, 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 um, because none of BNs is known. Because, because yeah, zeros in denominator no, no, are not known. Yes. But denominator are unknown. So, yes. so you can just find the uh, residues. Yes. With respect to those BN, uh, those AN that lie, that correspond to A. Yes. So um, as I see, actually, you don't need uh, this uh, her, uh, so, uh, her uh, property. So uh, you can you, you can just uh, calculate uh, residues, and that's that that that's would be enough to uh, to construct M function. So, so I, I mean. I, I mean, I actually, as I rem as I understood, but maybe I uh, maybe it's not correct. But as I see, the item, uh, the third, uh, the third po point mm -hmm. is not necessary. Uh, so, so actually, if you if you uh, don't know this representation three, mm -hmm. you would make the same without without any problem. I, I mean, uh, you 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 could uh, uh, anyway you could uh, find the m, uh, m function uh, using this information, mixed information. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. But uh, 
note that for the mixed information, we know residues only with index. Yes, yes, index. no, 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 no. You will uh, find uh, this residues mm -hmm. uh, only for this, mm -hmm. but this residues will, will be multiplied with the uh, values of the, of the second uh, multiplier. Yes. In the, in the corresponding points. Because you see, because a n that uh, in, I included in the first uh, multiplier and a n that I included in the second one uh, don't intersect. Yes. So you you, you just so the uh, the radius the radius the radius, the radius of the first multiplier are uh, the radius. Uh, so. The, um, But for me, when I was working it, it was not clear for me to have to obtain residues for the unknown for this index. I mean, residues for n except a. So that's why I tried to eliminate this, uh, eliminate this part. And that's why I used the third item because yeah. Yeah, that, was my, that was the approach I used. But. So I, I mean I mean the following. Um, uh, you know uh, global uh, so residues of the fun m function in the points a n while a belongs to a. Yes. A so then you uh, find the second the second multiplier. Mm -hmm. Put uh, in the second multiplier you substitute instead of uh, that you substitute a n mm -hmm. from the first part and then you divide. This residues with the first with the second part in these points, and then you obtain the residues in the of the first multiplier. Sure, but uh, it's not clear to me how to obtain residues with index set outside A. You don't need to obtain to obtain these residues. You just you so um, this function, the second multiplier, is analytic. In, yes. the, uh, in the poles of the first multiplier. Yes. So you can just divide it and that's all. Yes, yes, you are right. But then we obtain just the function f, don't we? Uh, no, we obtain the function f. The function, uh, the function, f, the function f is the first multiplier. Mm -hmm. The second multiplier is known because you know the, the corresponding uh, zeros. Mm, yeah. And then you multiply and you obtain a function. So without uh, applying the formula uh, number three. Mm. I see. So, okay. so it, it, it's a question, if, if, if I write or not. <laughs> I mean, uh, no, no, maybe you don't need to answer now, but, but it's just- here, Maybe I can think about it. You, you can First of all, also this C is also unknown, but I don't know. Yeah, no, C, C you can be found from asymptotics. Yeah, C, yeah, we know an explicitly, so we can. Uh, no, about C is also some maybe question that uh, should be checked. It may be. And, uh, and, and, and how do you use uh, Formula 3? How do I use? Formula three in formula three since since an and bn have the interlacing property, f is a meromorphic Hercules function. Mm -hmm. So formula three is nothing but the Hercules representation theorem. And in this formula three, in the summation, we have just ans and residues with index a, and we know all of them. So one just needs to find uniqueness of the linear part, and this is what I did. I showed that if you have another function, let's say f tilde, mm -hmm. with the same properties, and uh, the difference between f and f tilde will be just difference of the linear parts. And I showed that in that case, actually, the coefficient of z, which is b, should be zero, and d is uniquely recovered. And then what happens is the right hand side is uniquely recovered in item three. Therefore, f is uniquely recovered. If f is uniquely recovered, so that means the BN, which are unknown to us 
are also uniquely recovered, so we can use Borg Levinson. So that was the approach I used. So uh, it's, um, but you see, you use uh, residues F in points A, N. Yes, yes, yes. But how do you cal calculate them? Yeah, as, as you said, I mean, uh, as I said, to call, the residue at AN is known for M. And if you plug in AN to the second factor, the second factor is well known. Mm -hmm. So you just plug in AN, which you know. Mm -hmm. So that's how you, you how you obtain the residues. Actually, this is similar to the idea you suggested. This is how I obtain the residues. Oh, OK. But if you have they are not explicitly given, but using that fact divided. Yeah. yeah. But when you have residues, you can um, uh, the, uh, write the function f via uh, series by a series. Yes. Uh, residues divided by z, uh, z minus a m. Yes. And uh, would it be the same f that you that uh, formula three gives? Uh... I may need to write it down and check, but it seems so. It seems so. Or, or, or uh, it's also also important to calculate B, B and D. So B and D can be sure that they are uniquely determined. To say that F is uniquely determined, if you want to use this, because in this representation you don't directly get the uniqueness of the linear term. You need to show this, but it is doable. Okay, I guess. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry for the long question. Thank you. No, of course. Yeah. Okay. I Anyone? Have also comment. Uh -huh. yes. yes, please. Uh, Sergey, uh, uh, you see um, this uh, formula uh, for F? Uh, oh. I think. Uh, oh, could you please return this slide? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. This formula number three. Uh, I, uh, I'm not sure, but I, I guess that uh, uh, for this formula, you don't need f to be a Herbert's function. Uh, you just need uh, the representation for f as a product. If you have this representation, I guess you can uh, derive this formula uh, because um, this is just uh, our usual formula. Um, when the while uh, matrix is repre represented as a, a series uh, by um, uh, re uh, residues and uh, eigenvalues, uh, but uh, this is a, a regularization of this formula. This uh, 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 this second uh, term, a n divided by one plus a n squared. This is uh, the regularization term. Mm -hmm. So I think this formula will be uh, valid, uh, even uh, for example, if you have uh, a non-self-adjoint case, if a n and b n are com uh, complex numbers not real, I think that uh, this formula will be valid and uh, this approach will work if they are simple. Um, uh, uh, let, let, me, uh, let me also add some, some comment. Uh, so, so, so you just mean that uh, there is, so this formula three uh, can be used in a non self adjoint case? I think so, uh, uh, if you, the points are simple. You see, this formula three is a special formula. It, it's special representation for the one linear function. So this formula, as I understand, as I understand, uh, maybe the speaker can uh, correct me. Uh, th this form, uh, zeros and poles of this form, of this function f uh, represented by this formula, all, all this interlace. Yeah, 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 because yes, they are from two spectra with the same index set, so they are interlacing, yes. So this means that you cannot take arbitrary a n and b n, they also should interlace. Uh, yes, maybe there should be some restrictions. On yes, this. there is some, yeah. some restriction, and uh, 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 no, uh, some another comment about my first uh, question. Uh, so um, you see, um, this, um, uh, this uh, problem, uh, mixed with mixed spectral data can be uh, can be uh, opposed also in non self adjoint case, and that uh, the way to construct M function for non self adjoint operator th there is also a M function. The same. No, I, 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 yes, the uh, actually. Um, 
Yes, and the, it, it has the same representation, but uh, the difference that the eigenvalues and uh, uh, both in nominator and denominator can be can be complex and multiple and so on, but uh, uh, infinite product looks the same. So, uh, and also for non self adjoint case, the idea uh, to consider the inverse problem pro from mixed spectral data. So when you take part of uh, eigenvalues and, and um, part of um, uh, uh, normal constants can, can be also, uh, so, uh, so can be also studied. But in this case, you, you, can, you have no Nivandino functions in non self adjoint case. Uh, there is no interlace interlacement of eigenvalues and so on, and no no I any one in a function. But uh, your uh, first your um, uh, inverse problem can be also can, can I, I I believe that uh, also can be solved by by uh, by just using by just using uh, analytical properties. Mm. Uh, uh, so the, that, that may be possible because in the non-matching index set case, because we lost the interlacing property, we lost this representation, and I proved a lemma which kind of give us a similar representation here. The difference was having a second degree polynomial, but as you said, I used some analytic properties and the uh, the asymptotic properties of the eigenvalues. But yeah, I mean, one cannot automatically get this representation. It depends on your situation. Okay. Any other comments or questions? I have a question. Yes, please. Uh, can you find the Horvath theorem? Sure. Okay, uh, here uh, you have a one spectrum or two spectrum, or actually oh, they, they are taken of a subset of one spectrum, the sigma. Uh, okay, uh, maybe there is a uh, misprint because uh, A should be greater than pi half, or I am wrong. Mm -hmm. Because you have that the potential is known on some interval. Yeah, I think maybe, I think, yeah, there should be something. Maybe here A should be between pi over two and pi. Uh, yes. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, thank you for that. Okay, okay. Uh, or actually maybe it may be the case, like if your A is less than pi over two, you may not get it, get the uh, this completeness result. Ah. And if and only if, you cannot get the other way around. Mm -hmm. So theorem holds for any A. Uh, in, in, <laughs> fact, a yeah. uh, in fact, as far as I remember, Horvath uh, studied uh, the problem when uh, he, ta he takes uh, eigenvalues from different boundary conditions. So um, uh, yeah. maybe not in this theorem, but in his other theorems, he takes uh, every lambda m have its own alpha m. Yes. Yeah. And, yes. Uh, and yes. then uh, alpha m can be arbitrary, but uh, this condition is necessary and sufficient. Uh, this condition of completeness. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for additional remarks. Okay, Dan. If there is no other questions, maybe we can call the day. Thanks a lot for joining us today, and see you next time. Thanks a lot for the excellent talk again, Brock. No, thank you. Thank you all for attending. Okay, so uh, see you next time. See you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you.